Good morning. Welcome to an Options Income Blueprint, Options Income Weekly Live Report with Michael Shulman on June 6, 2022 at 11 a.m. Eastern. And my name is Emily Norris with Traders Reserve. If you have any questions throughout the session, feel free to pop those in the Q&A box. We'll get to those once Michael has wrapped up. Just a reminder, we meet tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern for our next live trading session. You should have your full June schedule in your inbox, just one link to register for all of those sessions. With that, I'll let you take it away, Michael. Thank you, Emily. Uh, happy Monday, everybody. Um, again, just a reminder about tomorrow. Um, we're going to discuss trades results from last week. A little bit more discussion of the market, given what's gone on the past week, where we had a positive week and are back above 4,100 on the SP 500. And I want to go back to something I've harped on a little bit in the video recorded updates, is closing early. And what's the structure? What is the design of a trade before you sell a put or a call? What's the design uh, that gives you some guidance on when to close it? So last week, um, two positions, United Airlines and Starbucks, uh, we opened them and closed them. And uh, United was closed uh, because of concern it was getting too close to the strike price airlines. I would not trade an airline, for example, every single week. Uh, American Airlines, uh, subsequent to United, uh, that trade uh, said things were softening maybe in their forecast. And people do not know, analysts do not know, I do not know how soft Q4, maybe even Q3 will be when kids are back in school and the weather starts to change and so forth and so on. And Starbucks, it was just time to go. Uh, very nice uh, position, but why stay? In the position, tie up capital and keep it open. We can close it with a very nice profit. We also were quite busy rolling. And uh, the I cannot emphasize this enough. I know, and I've said this before. Uh, I say it during live trading sessions. I say it during the updates. I know many of you are frustrated because roll positions tie up your capital. The purpose of what we do here is to generate cash. And should we have short-term hits against... The, the, the value of our portfolio, and this is not a portfolio service, cash historically, last 10 and a half years here, um, catches up. And the amount of cash we're generating may be slow, although half a percent to 1% a week is pretty good. Um, it, it usually, uh, not usually, it almost always has compensated for short-term downturns in, in the value of a position and uh, the role of that position in, excuse me, your portfolio. <clears throat> so we exceeded goal. We're back to exceeding goal. We had a couple of weeks, a little bit under goal. Um, but given the amount of capital we used, uh, the cash in and the cash out was really good. Uh, and it, was, it wasn't a guiding, a guiding force or guiding hand, whatever the word would be. But I, I am aware that some of you have smaller portfolios and I am aware uh, of the amount of positions we have outstanding, which is larger, long, bigger than we normally do. Um, but when I can get 0.7% return and we have an annualized return of 36%, I'm quite happy with what has transpired. <clears throat> and uh, these returns you know, are really where we want to be. Now, the question, of course, is will these returns continue? Will they get better? Will they get worse, et cetera, et cetera? And a lot depends on Uncle Market, Uncle Wall Street. Um, for us, I think the market's baked in three half point rate increases. The question is, what will their language be like? Uh, there is increasing uh, concern about an inflationary psychology taking place uh, or taking hold of the American people. This has happened in the past when gasoline prices spike because almost everyone, even the people who don't drive, uh, are very aware of the price of gasoline, I know I and my wife, when we're driving and if we're a little bit away from the normal driving and we'll go, oh, wow, look at that, or oh, wow, look at this. Um, we saw something for 519, we're used to paying 479, you know, that kind of thing. So everybody becomes aware of it. And the concern is, does that move over into general concern about buying now because of inflation, which theoretically kicks off an inflationary cycle. That hasn't happened. And very anecdotal data, meaning it's from different kinds of surveys. It's not that it's not comprehensive, but it's not aimed at this question is showing that no consumers have not adopted an inflationary mentality, except in housing. Um, 
and then some dry goods that have been hard uh, appliances to get. So that's something we have to keep in mind. How will the market react to the Fed's announcement next Thursday? Uh, next Wednesday, excuse me. And we're now back above the 4,100 mark, which was short-term support. It broke down for about a week and a half, and now we're back up again. Does that mean anything? Uh, you can take a look at charts and technical movements, and you say, well, depending upon how you define short-term, then we're back to a long-term trend of 4,100 polling. It's too, too hard to tell. So the market is now focused on what's going to happen with the Fed more than anything. It shrugged off Ukraine and China. If the Fed has neutral language, right? If the Fed's language is we're committing to two things, which is the interest rate increases we said we're going to put in place, and we're going to continue to be data dependent, the issue is that considered hawkish or dovish. That might be considered hawkish to some because economic data is getting weaker. But people, they, uh, people are forgetting something, uh, analysts are. And it's something that the Fed retreats into, but also takes very seriously, which is the Fed has two mandates. One is to keep inflation in check and B is to keep unemployment in check, not asset values, which is why we occasionally have boom and bust cycles, not economic growth. The corollary has always been, well, you need economic growth to get full employment. Well, we have 3.6% unemployment because of the lack of immigration the, in the past two, three, four years, the early retirements due to the pandemic and people's attitudes towards work changing. So if you put it all together, the Fed can say, hey, we have the unemployment thing licked. Now we can go uh, unfettered uh, to attack inflation. And that's what the hawks are thinking in the market. Um, I want to get down to something that we do, which is fundamentals. And the question that is really being debated, let, let's say for, among analysts who follow individual companies and don't talk about headwinds in the market, whatever, is what's the profit picture going into the third quarter? I mean, the second quarter announcements that take place in the third quarter. And the debate is really going on. So you have housing underperforming because a lot of it's algorithmic trading related to interest rates and a marked slowdown in new home mortgage applications. Chips are up because, oh, wait a minute, growth isn't that bad. Then growth data comes out that people don't like and chips go down. And yet the chip business has grown on a unit basis near 20% a year forever and on a revenue basis near at least 10% forever. Selected retail based on performance is going up. And if you're a retailer whose performance is not making it, you're going down. It's very stock specific. And megatech which are not tech, you know, Google, tech company. No, it's not. It's a marketing company. Amazon, it's a tech company. No, it's a retailer. Netflix, it's a tech company. No, it's a movie house. And But they're lumped together as tech. Apple is a real tech company. And there has been a flight to these as, as a growth safety uh, place. And so I just wanted to share all of this with you because it sets up this kind of uncertainty why we closed positions early and gave back some cash last week, even earlier than we have on some positions in the past. Now, I will continue to close new positions early and very aggressively. And it seems paradoxical. Well, why aren't you doing that for some of our rolled positions and then getting back in? Because rolled positions are just that, they're rolled and the goal is to break even because one of the, um, one of the philosophies, if you want to call it that, but it's also for me, it's a rule. I don't take losses on good companies unless I think the stock is dead. And I don't mean drifting, I mean dead. So it's just part and parcel of everything that we do here. Uh, now, if you get in on the second part of a role, send me an email if you're confused about why we're closing it, why we're doing X, Y, and Z. Anyway, let's get back to new positions being closed early and aggressively because we hit our target. Taking profits, of course, is never a mistake and never, ever, ever. And because the Fed is looming, that whole discussion I just shared with you that's going on on Wall Street about um, will the Fed do this, will the Fed do that in their verbiage, um, it's a big deal. So remember, excuse me, I apologize. Whoops. There we go. So 
for those of you who are new or for those of you who have cognitive dissonance and love to trade, but forget that I start with the fundamentals of the real world first, I use fundamentals <clears throat> and it, it's not fundamental stock analysis, it sort of is, um, but it really goes down to the real world. And it's trends, companies and stocks. And from there, you, I turn my head, you should too, to the market. You're looking at charts, chains and premiums. Now, the market is increasingly embracing selective stock picking in those sectors, housing, uh, retail, chips, megatech that I mentioned. And at the same time, there's an underpinning of uncertainty and volatility, which makes us able to sell puts considerably more out of the money. But that doesn't change. I don't look at a premium say I can sell something 10% of the money and do 1% rate of return. What if it's a horrible company? You don't do it. Because when you sell a put, you're telling yourself, you're telling the world, I'm willing to buy the shares at this price. So when you're closing at break even or loss, this before closing for profit, depends on the original intent of the position, not the trade itself. What, what, what did I want to do by getting into general owners? I want to generate cash. Uh, I'm not indifferent to the way the stock moves. It's, we've been in for a very long period of time. We've been in it twice, but it's throwing off half a percent to 8% a week. Uh, it's great. The stock is a fairly overvalued, <clears throat> fairly valued or overvalued, excuse me, it's allergy season. <clears throat> and that is based the way I do it. It's how is it trading against historical metrics for the stock in the context of historical metrics for the stock trading against the market and its sector. What does that mean? Is the stock of course, this is valued on traditional things like a PE or a PEG ratio. But <clears throat> if the stock is a PE of 11, and historically it has 17, that should tell you it's undervalued. However, if everything in its sector is trading at 11, when it always traded at 17, it means being pulled down by the sector, and it may be fairly valued based on the opinion of Wall Street, and they have the final word. So I do look at that. And it's a short-term trading, like United Airlines, like Starbucks, um, not long-term cash flow. <clears throat> long-term cash flow were our core stocks, <clears throat> excuse me, or if we get stuck, I'll use the word, in a position like Bank of America, where I was anticipating getting out, it still throws off huge amounts of cash, so we're going to keep it there until we break even. So the decision you have is, do I want to free up capital and move on if I can break even and there's a better opportunity? Um, so let's take this to the specifics. <clears throat> the market is uncertain, especially about the airline sector. There's more and more concern that we're getting this big, I, I, I mentioned this, I think, in live trading last week. My wife has a business trip. She now has two. It's the same location, Colorado. And she's actually on her way to Milwaukee as we speak. And it's astonishing what airfares are compared to not just a year ago, but six months ago. And uh, I checked fares and I check hotel prices every Friday anyway, but when it's hitting your own wallet, it's like, whoa, well, it's a business trip. But the market is uncertain for that reason. How long can the airlines sustain uh, these kind of prices? Uh, so I think I thought with the United Airlines, the stock was fairly valued based on the sector. I think based on its balance sheet, you could say, you could argue it's overvalued compared to history. But it's trading the way the sector is trading. The trade is trading on the way the sector is being viewed in terms of cash flow and losses and profits. And so the charts are asking, telling, screaming with the with the forty five dollar price point hold by Friday. And trading at break even, we made a few pennies. Was a better choice than rolling or waiting because the uncertainty surrounding the stock. So because of uncertainty surrounding the stock, not having to take a loss, knowing we could get into an airline again in a day or week or two. Um, it was just a better choice. And it goes back to the intent of the trade. The intent was opportunistic. It wasn't for weekly, 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 weekly cash flow. And we were aware that the sector itself was quite volatile and independent of what United Airlines might announce to the world, uh, which they had actually a few days before Americans announced, but they, um, they would trade down if the, if the sector did. And then you take a look at what we did with Starbucks. Starbucks was actually trading with coffee prices and trading the dollar. And what do I mean by that? When the dollar goes up, coffee prices, you can buy more coffee because they are they come from mostly emerging world countries. Um, some of them are not so emerging like, like Indonesia, but then you also have Kenya and you have Ethiopia, 
you have South and Latin American countries. And for hardcore, let's crunch a million numbers in a gigantic spreadsheet, there are algorithms that say their coffee costs are going to go down X because the dollar is going up Y. Fundamentally, Starbucks is about as dominant a brand as you're going to get. There are no other coffee brands. There's Dunkin' Donuts and there's McDonald's. But that's not, it's a very important to their business, but it's not what their Dunkin' Donuts actually, in my mind, predated uh, Starbucks as a ubiquitous national brand for, for drinkable coffee. Um, but the bottom line is, is the stock is undervalued given the moat that it has around itself. And, and uh, there was a big piece today about Howard Schultz and they're looking, he's the CEO, interim CEO and the founder of the company. They're looking for a new CEO. He wants people from outside the company. He's cleaning house, got rid of the head of HR. I think he got head of the head, got rid of the vice president, some part of operations or all of operations. And one of the reasons is more than 50% of their revenue is now from cold drinks that are takeout. And that's of course the, a year, not just for the summer months. Um, so you put it all together, they're a really well-positioned company. So I consider them to be undervalued. To me, they're a Buffett company, which is they have a moat uh, surrounding you uh, called the brand. The charts are unpredictable when the Fed meets, even with Starbucks, perhaps more because the dollar may move abruptly. Now, if, if the Fed is more hawkish than anticipated, um, bonds will take a hit, equities take a hit, and the dollar is going to go up. And if the dollar goes up, then maybe Starbucks goes up with it. But the bottom line on the trade was with the goals we have for ourselves here, we booked a profit with a 38% annualized return. What's not to like? So for all this cloudiness about the market and what's the Fed going to do or whatever, this nice profit with a terrific annualized rate of return was staring us in the face. So you just do it. And um, I cannot emphasize enough, many of you have taken six-figure portfolio coaching where this is the heart and soul of the boot camp, and this is the heart and soul of tying the boot camp, um, uh, a three-day boot camp, three-session boot camp, about setting goals, and you set the most macro level of goals. I have a two hundred thousand dollar portfolio. I want to generate forty-five thousand dollars in cash and income after it's all said and done. After twelve months, what does that mean per week? What does that mean per quarter? What does it mean per month? What does it mean per trade? And when you have the goal going into a trade, the complicating factor is, well, should I close it early because there's another opportunity? You should never, of course, close, you know, if things are going your way, if the stock is going your way, the premiums are decreasing, it's getting cheaper by four hour increments to buy the position back. Sure, you watch and you wait, but then you have to do the math. If you can buy something back for a dime on a Wednesday and it's a $50 put, there's no way you would ever sell a $50 put for 10 cents. So you close it and you have freed up capital. And I also work on the assumption you'll be trading things other than what we trade here. Um, but it all starts and ends with goals. The goal for your portfolio for the year, for your life, what you want to do versus what was the goal when you put the position on, when you clicked and it said sell. And remember that even as... Um, I'm talking about setting goals for a trade. It's also the goals for the position itself, which is a series of trades, which goes back to what I said a few moments ago. Citibank, Citigroup, General Motors, um, Pfizer, Marvel, they're throwing off very large amounts of cash, their cash engine here. And that's, their, that's the position. That's what we're using them for. And trades may be more opportunistic like United and Starbucks, and you trade them differently. So with that, I will turn it back to Emily and your questions. All right, Michael. Uh, James says, why is first solar trading lower when Biden is talking about dropping tariffs on solar products? Because they manufacture domestically. And this may have been anticipated and people getting out because the stock didn't move too much in the morning. Uh, they do not um, get materials uh, from China for their panels. They use a different technology and they use large scale. They build large scale industrial projects. That's the heart of their business or electric projects. And that the stock will move based on the prognosis for backlog. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons. Hey, Enrico says, can you please elaborate on the fundamentals you are looking at? Well, and what my fundamentals start with walking around a shopping mall, 
spending a few hours with 10 magazines over the weekend or through the course of the week, talking to people who are running hotels, walking around, I'm name dropping, walking around Rome, sort of the first big week they were open and talking to tour guides who hadn't walk, worked in two years and talking to freelance journalists about the, and a couple of business people about the European economy. So it's very, very granular. Um, it goes to the Peter Lynch comment, if you like the printer by the printer company. And I, I sort of take that to heart. So, um, and I track at the core level um, demographics and what, what are, it's, it's, a, it's an abused term, it's called psychographics. It's consumer buying mentality uh, by demographic group. And I, I spotted, and I wasn't necessarily ahead of people, but I was certainly ahead of the majority of traders on Wall Street investors at 10, 12 years ago. Um, about a psychographic change based on age and that baby boomers were just beginning to retire and younger people under the age of 30 um, were going to less and less formality and more and more ease of living. So it meant athletic wear, travel, sushi, no more fancy couches and cashmere sweaters. And it sounds simple, but when you, it's, it's almost like looking at an overall headwind in the market. You're looking at what are the headwinds or the supporting winds for a company. And uh, so those are the fundamentals deep down in the nitty gritty of the real world. And then you take that and you do stock and you do company analysis, not stock analysis. How is William Sonoma performing vis-a-vis -vis other specialty retailers and vis-a-vis other specialty home goods retailers. And that includes all their brands. Then you look at how, um, how is the company's fundamentals then lining up with the stock valuation? I get at least two questions. Well, it used to be, not anymore. It used to be two questions a week about Tesla. Why don't we trade it? I think what's going on is an example. I think Tesla is still 90% overvalued. That Tesla is a battery company that's posing as a car company. And if I were running Tesla, I'd sell the car outfit to somebody and all I would do is batteries and I would become the most important company in the world. The waste of capital and the distraction of management to build solar this and cars works against their core incredible talent at making batteries, which is much harder than making a car. Well, Scientifically, it's harder to make a car. It's less, it's as difficult production-wise. So a company like Tesla, fundamentally, I don't like the way they're managed and structured. And then you take a look at the stock valuation, it's absurd. So, you know, if Elon Musk does this or the car industry does that, or EV support goes away or changes, the stock's going to get savaged, which it has been. So there's also a fundamental analysis of the stock after I like the company. And it's based on how the stock has traded in the past, but more importantly, that's charts too. It's what's the valuation. And I touched on it here. How is the stock being valued compared to historic valuations for the stock, for the stock in its sector, and for the stock in the stock market itself? And for example, General Motors um, is at historically low valuations. Now they may stick and change the equation. Pfizer may be the cheapest large company in the world. Bar none. And, but the street doesn't believe in COVID. So they think it's going away. And Pfizer keeps sticking with its $50 billion incremental revenue from COVID forecast. And et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes you also have to make a leap of faith, which I do, that eventually these fundamentals will push away the doubters on Wall Street. And in terms of research, it's a dozen to 20 business and industry publications and it's phone calls and stuff like that. Emily? Yep, hold on just a second. Okay. Uh, Frank says, can you share your opinion on Chewy now that earnings have come out? Um, Let's take a look at where it's trading.
So if you take a look at how it traded, earnings came out after the close on Thursday. Whoa, sorry about that. I don't know why that default came up. This is the 20 day chart, but if you even take a look at the five day, really it's sold off. The, the company is still wrestling with core problems, which are operating margins, basically. Uh, they lost a little bit of share. Their auto ship people, which means you, you get it without asking for it. You just get it every month, the pet supplies, whatever it might be. It's still very strong, but people would like to see it be increasing. And um, so I, there's an opinion about the company, opinion about the stock. I think the stock where you see the gap where it popped and it went from uh, about 23 to 27, which is actually a big deal because the stock was over 100. Uh, you know, that shows that it took a lot of steam out. This might have been a little bit of a short squeeze, although there's not too much room for the stock to go down anymore. And this is a dominant brand. I mean, the only other, they're probably second to Amazon, but a lot of people are second to Amazon, which to me means it's a pure play. Um, uh, Chewy is the only game in town. So if you're patient and you're willing to sell puts and calls, you can do a percent a week. Let's take a look. So if you take a look, the stock's trading at 27. So if you sold a 24.50, which is more than 10% out of the money, you can do 10%. If you're trying to recover back to 100, that would take you a couple of thousand centuries to do it um, because you're working off a smaller base. You would have to go to leaps and sell calls off of leaps. That's the trading aspect. The company itself still continues. It had surprise, by the way, profit. I should have said that to begin with. There was an expected loss. I think it was 14 cents, and I think they made a nickel. And... That's one of the reasons to stock pop. Now, if they can maintain profitability in the next quarter, um, even at a nickel, then if they can combine that with 10% or more growth for two quarters in a row, it could come back to being an online brand, 10% grower, profitable, not burning cash. And that's a $50 stock. But that's another earnings announcement. So my opinion is, I think most of the downside has been taken out of the stock, working on the assumption that management can continue to do the kinds of things it did in the previous quarter, but we don't know that they can. Um, my, I'd say there's two thirds chance, 75% chance they can. Uh, but I, myself, um, I don't think we're gonna trade it here until another quarter of earnings. Um, see, this one is about um, looks like cash versus um, he says your comments are spot on for cash accounts um, but it does not address the drawdown <clears throat> what I'm saying is making 50,000 cash is nice but when it costs you 70,000 in drawdown I have no um, idea what that means if they're talking about margin portfolio value and if you're talking about portfolio value, um, over time, generating cash overcomes falls in portfolio value. It has for the last 10 years in the service. I um, think it's about having the, so a paper loss versus a- Yeah. And I, I you know, paper losses drive everybody crazy, including me sometimes. But the, I think long-term and I, we trade short-term. And if, you know, you're down- a certain amount of money over three months, my regrets, but this is the market. You're in equities. This happens and it'll happen again. And then we'll go up and it'll happen again. The trick is a trick. The approach is to think long-term and only look at really good companies. Try to get your cash, you know, at five tenths, to eight tenths of percent a week. And even if the market's down 25%, you're going to be at break even at the end of a 12 month period and everybody else is going to be down 20%. 
So um, this is what we do when we've done successfully, or I've done successfully for more than a decade in the service, and I'm not going to change. Um, the track record speaks for itself, including crashes, corrections, everything. This is longer, and we, we could be in the um, third or fourth inning of a serious bear market. But if a bear market goes down slowly, we'll make more money than if a bull market goes up slowly because of increased volatility. It sounds strange, but it's the truth. We got hit and stuck in position starting after Thanksgiving. Um, there was a compression in price earnings multiples on high PE stocks, which we, which we traded a lot of. Uh, and then it happened again when the Fed did make their announcements and go, wait a minute, I thought, I, this is on me, I thought it was priced it in December when we sold off, and then Ukraine. Um, and so it's much longer to get to break even, but the philosophy, as I said, of the services is if it's a good company, we're hanging on and we're going to trade and generate cash because think of it, you might be frustrated, but if you get hit on a stock and it's down 20% and you sell it, well, what's the value? The value is what, not what you paid for it. The value is what it's worth in the market when you sell it. And, um, that is the basis for doing your rate of return calculations to generate cash. Uh, so it's not a, we don't trade a portfolio here. We do positions and, um, it works and it may take longer this time because of what's going on in the bond market, interest rates and equities, but it works. Okay. Hey, Michael, Ben says your thoughts on Crocs, please. Um, companies executing quite well. The stock has been crushed. Um, and, uh, I went to a wedding where someone was wearing Crocs, excuse me, bar mitzvah. Um, and it's really been doing quite nicely, I would say the last month. Let's take a look at the monthly chart. Oh, here we go again. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, this is the, that's the five day, but We're going to get resistance here, but the company's really executing. For those of you completely unfamiliar, rubberized shoes that have been around for a really long time and exploded during the pandemic, starting in healthcare and then kids in the backyard getting muddy. Uh, healthcare, you went from people in ICUs and emergency uh, uh, operating rooms wearing them because you can stick them in a sterilizer to everybody had to because of COVID. And people didn't want their kids trashing their Nikes and buying $29 Crocs that you can throw in the washing machine. Plus now everybody's wearing them. Um, they've executed extremely well in terms of their sourcing, their pricing, everything they've held off. They're a generic, they're a generic Crocs, if you want to call them that, generic rubber rush you can get at Walmart or whatever. But they, they really haven't been touched or hurt by that in any way, shape or form. And um, so I like it very, very much. The issue, this is the, the three month chart, excuse me, the one month chart. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, if you've been in the stock for a long time, the stock exploded. It was up to 180. It's all the way down here around 60. Um, and it's got a high multiple. It doesn't earn a lot of money. Uh, it sold off in part when they bought a men's clothing company, which I think was a mistake, but it's been accretive and it's been generating positive cash flow, cash flow and margin. Um, so I like it longer term. I really do. I think they're executing really, really well. Uh, you're going to have places like you just saw, we're probably a couple of dollars away from a 30 day high. And you'll probably see some technical resistance when that happens. And then it's a question of whether they can expand profitability and how the, the, the world treats it. Um, it's not sexy like Lululemon, but in many ways it's performing the way Lululemon did, I don't know, 10 years ago. Okay. Um... Also, the can you comment on Yeti? It's actually a good parallel stock we got hit on. We took a loss. Actually, we've just mentioned three stocks that we closed in the Income Masters program and took losses on because I saw the stocks not moving correctly. I, I was incorrect with the trade, but I was correct about they're not going to move too much uh, until there's a couple of earnings announcements behind them. Yeti is the Cadillac of thermoses and related outdoor gear. And um, same thing. They have an almost unassailable brand at the top end of the market. And the question is, how large 
is the top end of the market. Is it larger? Is Yeti going to go down? The question is, is Yeti going to go to lower price products? Are they going to expand? Wait a minute. I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? And can they expand outside of their niche? Are they going to do internationally? It's hard to imagine. Um, uh, European spending what people in the United States spend on water bottles. Um, but, and this is the one year chart. And, you know, of course, they've created as well. The company itself has, <laughs> excuse me, has been performing very, very well. So you can see the specialty retailers that completely fell, fell off the couch, just completely fell apart. Uh, Yeti Crocs and to a lesser extent, Chewy, they're all stabilized and beginning to move up and not with the sector. It's based on company performance. Um, but again, I would like to see Wall Street reaction to two earnings announcements before we probably trade it again. I'm sorry, Emily. So that seems to be it for uh, options. Okay. Oh, wait, so, here's one coming in. Um, Mike says, with the Fed's quantitative easing kicking in, do you think this Quantitative time, tightening, by the way, not easing. But that's what, it, that's what he wrote. Yeah. This is a different, or do you think this time is a different market environment versus your past 10 years of, of experience, 10 plus years? Yes. Um, it, it's different insofar as we've been in a 40-year bull market. If you step back and you were an economics professor teaching trade, not trading, but markets, you would say the bull market started with Paul Volcker going after inflation and in, you know, around the time that Reagan was elected. So politicians took credit for the great Reagan resurgence in the stock market and nothing to do with him. It had to do with the Fed. And we have crashes, we have corrections, internet bubble, 1987 Bloody Monday. We have covid uh, we have the 08 to 010 crash, but each one has been countered in some way by either a Fed reaction or the, the economy. And you, now you have um, a belief that the economy is throwing off the training wheels provided by the Fed uh, from COVID and the Fed's going to tighten. And that's going to lead, of course, to higher interest rates as, for a while which will affect the bond market, which will spill over into equity. So I think there's more than a 50% chance that we'll continue to see downward pressure. The question for us is not whether it's a bull, this is a market neutral approach. It's not a matter of whether it's a bearable market. It's the speed and it's the volatility creating premium. Anything other than 3% a day, okay, uh, is very manageable. I don't care if the market's going up or down one, one and a half percent, maybe even 2%. We're getting used to it in a given day. That is the hard part for us. But um, the direction of the market is less important. Now, it's important that a, a bearish market creates headwinds and it takes certain stocks off the table. Um, and it makes like, for example, the downward move in the indexes affects General Motors because it often trades with the Dow and with the S&P 500 independent of the auto sector. And the auto sector, the, what's left of it, um, of the traditional big guys, they trade with the indexes, um, independent of demand for cars or profits or what have you. But for the most part, um, the 10 years experience that we have or I have is about understanding the impact of volatility on profitability here, the impact of volatility on what kind of trades we put in place. So um, we were asked many times to put in core positions. I put them in uh, and now probably half the people, I, I'm not, I'm sort of making this up, but I'm guessing half the people wanted core positions now can't stand them because we're in there for six months, throw off lots of cash, but they're flashing red in our portfolios. So what have I learned? For, it's a very good question. It's one of the better questions that's been asked, I think, this entire year. So I want to compliment you on that. Uh, is, is the experience of the last 10 years relevant? Yes, because I did do performance numbers based on successful trades, not on portfolio values, I've emphasized. And other than getting stuck in a couple of long-term trades like Bank of America, the core positions, as I said, I'm indifferent. It's just they're cash machines. But other than 
uh, Bank of America and Sunrun. Most of our trades, looking at 85, 90% of our trades have been open and closed in very reasonable periods of time at break-even or profitability. And that's always what we've done. It's always a 95% break-even or positive close rate for the service during the, the crash. And the crash, COVID crash isn't a fair, and to your point, it's not really fair. It was a Black Swan event lasted five weeks. Um, so that's not comparable, but we only closed five losers. That was it. And that was across all my services. That's not the case now. We're going to be grinding away on the four core positions for a while and maybe a couple of others for as long as they throw off cash. And I still like the company and what Wall Street thinks of them. And uh, so the experience that I've learned in the past is to adjust trading, this bottom line, to adjust trading to market volatility, not to the market itself. So we have adjusted. We have a, a positions that are sold way out of the money. We're accepting lower rates of return at the initial trade, or we're trading um, and closing earlier. So the trading tactics have changed. I'm closing earlier more than any other time in the history of the service. And I'm, I'm focusing, trying to focus more on well out of the money and silly puts more than at any other times in the service. But that's being dictated by the market. You have to change with that. But the fundamentals don't change and market neutrality doesn't change. And, you know, my hope is that up or down, if we keep violent days to one to one and a half percent, we'll have a really, really good 2022. Any other questions? That's it. Thank you all. And I'll see you 11 o'clock tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Our or this has been recorded and will be posted to the member website. We meet tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern for our next live trading session. Thanks and have a good day trading.